There, excellent. Thank you, guys. Good morning, everybody. I want to invite everyone to, to grab their, their seat and to abruptly end all fellowship. All fellowship ends now. We're starting. You know, it's just so good to see you guys here early, uh, fellowshipping, interacting with one another, and um, I'm just very grateful for uh, the feedback and the encouragement. And, and to, the, to you, the faithful, as I preach to the choir, I'm going to employ you this week to uh, be evangelistic with the uh, equipping hour. So encourage all we got, We're ready to go. We got enough kids here to have our own uh, NGM ministry this first hour. So um, anybody who's not here, just rebuke them. <laughs> rebuke them, in, I mean, in, with, with Christian love, of course. But rebuke them sharply, unless they're older than you. Tone it down, but rebuke them. No, just kidding. I'm just, I, well, sort of. <laughs> Uh, all that to say, I do appreciate um, just how Equipping Hour over the last um, uh, five months, I guess, has become just part of routine, and so thank you for committing to it, and it's just really encouraging for us as families to be able to um, rally around these things, to spend time in God's Word, and, and then uh, that becomes fuel for conversations and small groups and home studies and everything else, so we're so grateful uh, for God's Word. I'm grateful for your commitment to this, to this time. So let's just begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word, and we're so thankful for the possibility of fearing you. The fear of you is, is not just possible, it's actually promised to those who tremble at your word. And this morning, Lord, as we look at what, what, what it really means to fear you, the, the essence of the fear of the Lord, what is it, this virtue, I, I just pray, Lord, that your word would impress upon our hearts the incredible need to always fear you and to always be growing in our fear of you. Uh, I pray that this, this study would just be a foundation for godly living, for growth in discernment, for growth in sobriety. I, I pray that it would uh, sharpen our senses, that it would um, quicken our minds, our hearts, our conscience, our sensitivities as we uh, calibrate everything that we are around the, the, the centerpiece of you. Uh, Lord, I, I thank you for even how this study has affected my own heart, um, even seeing um, this week uh, even complacency about fearing you. And so even before we dive into the study this morning, Lord, I just want to Pray for all of us as your children, and here at GBC, I pray, Lord, won't you use this study, won't you use this moment in your word as a means of grace to stir up awareness of any area of complacency where we are sinners, we cannot afford to be complacent about you, something so great and so grand as you. You are worthy of all worship, you are worthy of all fear, and so I do pray this study would be effective, to stir us up out of complacency into a vigorous, robust, biblical, virtuous fear of you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning our task is to um, define the fear of the Lord, the fear of God. What is the fear of the Lord? What is the fear of God? And I've held you in suspense long enough. We've uh, looked the last couple of weeks on the domestication of God and Really, I wanted to start with that because the fear of the Lord and our relationship with the Lord, is, it's so easy to um, water it down, to tame it down, to domesticate it, and make it something less than what the Bible says it ought to be. As we turn our attention to what the Bible does say positively about the fear of the Lord, I want to kind of contrast it with a very common definition of the word fear. And I think, honestly, when I think of the English word fear, the connotation that comes to your mind when, well... Let me just start with myself. The connotation that comes to my mind when I hear the English word fear is something that really doesn't quite fit oftentimes with the biblical evidence for what's described as the virtue of the fear of God. And, and here's why. If you, if you look up Merriam-Webster's dic dictionary, they have two entries, you know, the one for the noun and one for the verb. To fear and then the noun fear. The noun fear, the first two definitions are this. Number one, an unpleasant often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. And that's a very 
That, that, that's exactly what I would have expected when I think of the word fear. Because when I think of fear, you think of a terror because of some sort of threat. Terror comes into your mind, into your heart, into your psyche because there is a, a, an, an, an immediate awareness of something that's threatening. All is not well, and then fear ensues. It's just a natural reflex. And of course they say it's a strong emotion. Um, and emotion is, is, is uh, consistent throughout number one. Number one, B, an instance of this emotion. Number B, two, <laughs> a state marked by this emotion. So it's the emotion or a state of an awareness of danger. And so it's often unpleasant. Number two, Second definition for the noun, fear, fear as a noun, the abstract idea of fear, anxious concern, anxious concern. And so there's concern, there's, there's burden. And um, concern and burden are good words. Those will fit with the biblical criteria, but the anxiety, not so much. But again, you can see that these definitions are typical in how we use the word fear in the English language, but they, do, they will not actually fit with what we're going to see as the biblical evidence for the virtuous fear of God or fear of the Lord. And I'll use fear of God and fear of the Lord interchangeably. Now, Merriam-Webster defines the verb this way, to fear, the action of fearing. Number one, to be afraid of. Expect with alarm, fear the worst. To expect with alarm and to fear the worst. And so it's, 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 it's a regard for the object that is alarm, fearing the worst, this couldn't go, it's, it's going to go poorly. And, and, and honestly, that, that definition has a lot of overlap with our word to worry or, to be, or anxiety. And, and that also will not fit with the biblical data for what it means to fear the Lord. Well, as I've studied the fear of the Lord and I've sought to pursue the fear of the Lord for the last 20 years of my life, um, it's become apparent to me that the biblical data for and the description of what it means to fear the Lord does not quite fit with how we commonly use the word fear. And I think that's primarily because the common use of the word is almost always associated with a fear of threat and imminent danger. And so then we come to the Bible and we come to a classic text like 1 John 4, 18, perfect love casts out fear. And we start to think, well, okay, if I have a relationship with God, if I love God, then there must not be Fear, And then we look at what the, the Bible says hundreds of times, which describes a proper relationship with the living God as one that's con consumed with fear. And we're kind of scratching our heads sometimes thinking, well, what, what does that mean? How do these fit? And so I think that's why I started with the domestication of God is because too often in light of a verse like 1 John 4, 18, the tendency sometimes is, is to mute down the element of fear, which must remain fear, because we think, well, we've got to remove the element of threat. And so, what I want to do is try to flesh this out from a biblical perspective and give us and re remind us from the scriptures what it actually means to fear the Lord, what it is and what it isn't. And so I'm going to do a lot with what it isn't and then do a lot with what it is. And I think that's actually helpful. It's a clarifying tactic, um, and just to, to start with what it is not and, and then look at what it is biblically. But before we do that, let me give you a few definitions. I, I, I've, I've compiled some definitions over the years, um, and these are all helpful definitions. Um, I have five of them, uh, and, and I just actually want to read them to you. So just, just, just listen and uh, put down your pen. Just, just listen to these definitions. And you're going to start to see some themes, and we're going to see if these flesh out. And, and I think, by, in the main, all of these are going to flesh out as very biblical and helpful definitions. I don't want to waste your time this morning with bad definitions. Uh, here, here's a few that were, I found very helpful. First of all, going way back, John Bunyan, in the 17th century, said this, I take the grace of fear to be that which softens the heart. Now, that sounds radically different than Merriam-Webster's First two definitions of the noun fear. I take this grace of fear to be that which softens the heart and which makes it stand in awe of both the mercies and judgments 
of God. That's very helpful. It stands in awe of God's mercy and God's judgments. This is that which retains in the heart that do dread and reverence of the holy majesty, that it is fitting should both be in and be kept in the heart of poor sinners. He says that in his book, The Fear of God. Going, to, uh, going up a couple centuries to Charles Bridges in the 19th century, he wrote in his commentary on the Proverbs, he asks the question and answers it. But what is this fear of the Lord? It is that affectionate reverence. That's an interesting conjunction, isn't it? An affectionate reverence. He combines love and attraction with reverence, awe, fear. It is that affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends his His wrath is so bitter and his love so sweet that from this springs an earnest desire to please him. That is such an important aspect of the fear of the Lord. We're going to see that. It springs from an earnest desire to please him. And because of the danger of coming short from his own weakness and temptations, a holy watchfulness and fear that he might not sin against him. This enters into every exercise of the mind, every object of life. So just appreciate that statement there. His definition of the fear of the Lord means that every thought of the mind and everything you do in your life is is irretrievably affected by this all-consuming fear of the Lord. The oldest proficient in the divine school seeks a more complete molding into its spirit. In other words, you never stop growing in your fear of the Lord. The godly parent trains up his family under its influence. The Christian scholar honors it as the beginning, the head of all his knowledge, at once sanctifying its end and preserving him from its most subtle temptations. That was Charles Bridges. Contemporary, still alive, um, the hero of the faith, Albert Martin, said this, There is a legitimate sense in which the fear of God involves being afraid of God, being gripped with terror and dread. And this book came out in 2015, and I was so thrilled to read that definition because that's the element that seems to be so lost in more of the contemporary definitions of the fear of the Lord. There is just a legitimate sense where we just need to be honest and say, hey, fear is the right translation. That's the perfect word, fear of the Lord. And so it has this element of being afraid of God, being gripped with terror and dread. Though this is not the dominant thought in Scripture, it is there nonetheless. The second aspect of fear, which is peculiar to the true children of God, is the fear of veneration, honor, and awe with which we regard our God. It is a fear that leads us not to run from him, but to draw near to him through Jesus Christ and gladly to submit to him in faith, love, and obedience. It's a very real fear, driven by joy and and gladness and happiness at the prospect of submitting to God out of affection. Jerry Bridges wrote in the book, The Joy of Fearing God, He says, and he admits that he doesn't define it because it's better described than defined, which I found to be true. He says, it's a profound sense of awe toward God. It is undoubtedly the dominant element in the attitude or set of emotions, and then he wrote, you know, and then I, I would say better maybe virtues, that the Bible calls the fear of God. A popular definition of the fear of God is reverential awe, and I've concluded that this is indeed a good definition. There are indeed many facets to the fear of God and many outworkings of its presence in a believer's life. So to restrict its meaning only to reverential awe would fail to do justice to the biblical concept. But underneath all these many facets and outworkings is a profound sense of awe toward God that provides the motivation and driving force for all the other elements that together make up the biblical portrait of fearing God. And I appreciated that because he points out that reverence is a great biblical word. 
But we don't want to go with the reverence in order to undermine the actual meaning of the word fear. And so we need to do justice to the biblical concept. And if we only use reverence, that wouldn't quite do justice to all that the Bible says about what an actual fear of the Lord really is. Last, um, uh, John MacArthur wrote in his article, In Defense of Integrity, he said this, Having the fear of the Lord means holding God in such awe that a person is wholeheartedly motivated to pursue his holiness and his service. Holding God in such awe that you're consumed with serving him, ministering in his name. I mean, this is, the, the fear of the Lord is really the sun of the solar system of our soul, and it provides the gravity for everything. It's what holds everything in balance. It's so all-consuming. It's inescapable. It must govern all, every thought of the believer, every intention, every motive. And when it doesn't, we must be broken, and we must acknowledge, and we must fly straight to God and acknowledge we do not have what it takes to live in the fear of you as we ought to. And this is what we're going to see is so unique about the fear of the Lord is because every other fear that involves a fear of threat causes you to do what? Fight or flight. You flee. You get out of there. But the fear of God is a unique fear because it causes you to cling and to draw near instead of flee. So here's my attempt, not at a definition. I, I couldn't do that. I actually have tried, but I, I, I don't like anything I've ever come up with for a definition. So here's my description, my description of the fear of God. The fear of God involves more than a generic fear, but it's not less than an actual fear of God himself. It produces a clinging to God, trembling at his word, an obedience to all his commands, and a love of the one feared. The one who fears God is terrorized by the fear of offending God and consumed with the possibility of pleasing him. It recognizes intrinsic inability to fear the Lord on one's own ability. And it applies directly to God for the necessary grace to do so. Simply put, it's a fear that drives the sinner to instinctively cling to God, tremble at his word, obey his commands, and love him. So, what I want to do is present before you some biblical evidence, what fear of the Lord is not, and what the fear of the Lord is. And as we do so, just think about what we're doing here. What do you mean? We're listening to a sermon. I'm preaching a sermon, you're listening to a sermon. Now, beyond that, think about what we're doing here, while we're at church. Yeah, beyond that, we have professed to be Christians. We profess among all the peoples who walk this planet to know the living God. God must be so central to who we are and to how we think that he grips us in an inescapable way. We must be consumed with pleasing him and terrified at the thought of offending him. This everything. And as I've thought about the fear of the Lord, and I've looked at it once again, and I've studied it, and I've thought about what it is and what it isn't, let me just, even preemptively, before we look at the biblical data, just charge you. Older saint, we're about to look at some texts that are very familiar to you. And as we look at what's familiar to you, are you gripped by the greatness of God's being? You cannot afford to be complacent about him. And what I love about Equipping Hour, so many of you, even with young children, are, are coming here with your families. And so, young children, listen here for a second. You know what's so sweet? Is that you're sitting here under the word of God, listening to truth. And at times, you know, I might say something, and you're like, I don't know what that means. That's okay. But you know what's so, so incredible? Is you have the opportunity to learn what it means to fear God from God himself as he speaks to you. Fear of the Lord is not something you grow into. It's not for adults. Fear of the Lord is for humans. <laughs> and so young people, I want to charge you. 
I'm going to charge you. If you still live in your parents' house, I'm speaking to you right now. I am begging you to seek the Lord's help to live out what we're studying in, right here in this description of what it means to fear the Lord. Because I am telling you, I have seen it all too often. You, the lives of young people are totally predictable. If you do not bear the marks of fearing God now, you never will apart from God's grace intervening in your life. It is absolutely like clockwork. Young people, do not downplay the importance of fearing God in your own life. I'm not asking you, can you talk to your friends about it? I'm not asking you, can you answer questions about it? I'm asking you, do you live out the fear of the Lord? That's the question you want to be asking and answering as we do this. So, let's dive in. First of all, what it's not. Well, just mere honor, mere respect. That just doesn't go far enough. And I'm going to be really quick with that. Several of those uh, definitions mentioned that, including Jerry Bridges and John Bunyan. I'm not going to belabor that because that's what we did the last two weeks with this, the discussion on the domestication of God. Uh, fear of the Lord is the right word, and we always want to make sure that we don't water it down to just something like, you know, merely, oh yeah, we, th- we think highly of God, he's, he's, he's important. Well, but let's, let's keep pressing in because we've spent, spent two weeks talking about that one. Number two, what it's not is being scared or afraid of God. There's an important difference between the fear of the Lord and being scared of God. Being scared of the Lord or afraid of the Lord, being scared of God or afraid of God, is different than the virtue fearing God. These are absolutely not compatible. Let me show you that in one text. That's all we'll have time for. In Exodus chapter 19 and 20. Exodus 19 and 20. Turn in there and as you're, as you're making your way to... Exodus 19, you'll remember this is the beginning of the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant really goes from um, um, Exodus 19 all the way through through Exodus 30. I'm sorry, through Deuteronomy 30. And that's containing the Mosaic Covenant. And uh, that's the agreement between God and his people. I'm your God, you're my people, I'm holy. Uh, The gods of the nations are not holy, so you're going to live holy lives and you're going to be distinct from them because I'm distinct from their gods. And this is what it looks like. And the Mosaic Covenant are are the conditions on which God has guaranteed to bring about certain results. He's promised to them, to Abraham. And now these are the conditions on those promises. Which means that God has sworn to bring about the very conditions that he describes here. And um, of course, as you know, these conditions haven't yet been met. But nevertheless... We learn a lot about the fear of the Lord in the context in which they were first given. So, you, you remember 19 verses 4 through 6 is the laying out of how this is the, the agreement between God and his people. Uh, this is what it will be for you to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation if you do all that I command you in this law. And so then in verse 7 and following, we have the stipulations where Moses and the elders start to draw boundary lines around the mountain. Because they're on Mount Sinai and God is about to reveal himself on Mount Sinai. So in verse 10, the Lord says to Moses, I'm in Exodus 19, verse 10. The Lord also said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So you, you, you have this clear description that to touch the mountain when God's about to reveal himself is completely inappropriate, and they should be consumed at the, at, with fear at the prospect of dishonoring him. And in fact, he doesn't even want anybody to touch that person. Don't even apprehend him. Kill him from a distance. So Moses, verse 14, goes down from the mountain to the people, and he tells them, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. Verse 16, so it came about on the third day when it was morning, there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud from upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Now, that's a word that can be used in context for a fear of God. It's actually used even in Isaiah 66, talking about trembling at God's word. 
But here it's talking about just a generic fear. They are scared. They're scared because of the phenomena of the manifestation of God's glory on earth. Who would not fear if the mountain you're standing next to is suddenly enveloped in a thick cloud and suddenly it sounds like a multitude of trumpets sounding in a deafening roar from heaven and there's thunder and lightning. Verse 17, Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Verse 18, now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like a smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. So God talks and it just sounds as though thunder is roaring all around them. Verse 20, the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses goes up. Verse 21, the Lord spoke to Moses, go down. (laughs) You know, I love that. You just told us to get up here. You told me you come up here, so I came up. Okay, go down. Uh, warn the people so that they don't break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. I mean, clearly, this is not a safe prospect. Safety is not the name of the game here. This is not safe, what's happening. But God is so loving and so condescending, He is preparing them for an exposure to his revelation that will not consume them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. So remember I put up the little rope? Remember the turnstile and the little, you know, velvet, red velvet and the gold, you know, the silver stands? You know, we got, we got a, we, it's cordoned off. There's like a little line cue. They can't cross over. The Lord says in verse 24, go down and come up again. So he goes down and warns them a second time. And so he goes down and tells them, verse 25. Then, when he goes back up, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, record the Ten Commandments. This is the Ten Commandments. You're very familiar with that. And by the way, since we are talking about the fear of the Lord, there's not a lot of attributes of God that are revealed explicitly in the Ten Commandments. But you know what is? His jealousy. His jealousy. Verse 5. You shall not worship the other gods, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. His zeal, his jealousy, his zealous nature, zeal for his own glory, jealous for the exclusive worship and the exclusive love and devotion of his people. That's part of God's character, which is why he is so worthy to be feared. But I'm going to fast forward now to verse 18. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Oh, they're so godly. They feared God, right? No. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But let not God speak to us or we will die. Here is a fear that drives one away. This is not the virtuous fear of the Lord. It's not driving them to the Lord. It's driving them away from the Lord. It's terrifying to see the phenomena and in their sinful state they are fleeing saying we don't want to hear from that there's nothing that's that's not okay with us you if you talk to us fine we'll tolerate you speaking to us because we can manage you moses but not god speaking from the top of sinai and so what does moses say to them what an important exhortation in verse 20 don't be afraid The command here is to not be afraid. Don't be afraid. For God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him might remain with you so that you may not sin. Isn't that a fascinating verse? Don't be scared. Fear. Don't be afraid of God. Fear him. There's all the difference in the world. Do not be scared of God. Fear him. If you're scared of God, it drives you away from him. If you fear God, it drives you toward him. The difference is, of course, one is self-preserving, one's driven by a consuming desire to glorify God. 
the Israelites here are not virtuous. They are self-preserving. And so they are afraid. They are scared. They're not fearing God. They're just afraid. And that's not the biblical virtue of fear. So number one, it's not mere respect. Number two, it's not fear. Uh, it's not being afraid or scared. And number three, it's not a short-lived fear. It's not a short-lived fear. Many have feared, I suppose, I've been somewhat concerned about what they hear when they hear the scriptures taught. Their conscience kicks in. They have an ally. God has an ally in the conscience as he's created us in his image. And then that becomes informed by the word of God. And there has been fear, I suppose, but it's been short-lived. There's fear at times when we sin. There's fear at times about what would God think. But where it's short-lived, this is different than the virtuous fear of God. The human mind, by the way, is incredibly adept at turning down dimmer switches in the room of our own thinking. Think about it. Picture your brain like a room with a bunch of switches, and they've all got dimmers on them. And certain areas of the room are lit up that are a little bit like, you know what, that's been there a long time, and it just does not look good. And so we start turning down dimmer switches. I don't want that to show up. Turn it down. And so, as Ephesians 4, 17 to 19 describes, the Gentiles make a living of turning down dimmer switches, and they're darkened in the thinking of their own mind, and they're given over to sensuality. And so, people have often had short-lived fear, and then it does not last. It does not carry itself out into fruition. So, the issue with the fear of the Lord is not... Can you describe what it means to fear the Lord? Do you know passages about the fear of the Lord? The question when it comes to fear of the Lord is, do you actually order your life according to who God is? And this is why I've charged you for the last couple of weeks just saying, listen, the the battle for the fear of the Lord is, is fought and won in the privacy of your own mind. It's fought in the privacy of your own heart where no one else can know, not even your spouse, not your children, not your church, not your coworkers, where no one else knows you must win the battle of wanting to please the almighty creator in the privacy of your own conscience and so we sinners are incredibly adept at turning down dimmer switches and justifying areas where we're not fearing the lord and being exposed to something that should have been a means of causing a true fear of the lord but then not acting on it and then coming up with excuses why we didn't act on it, and then feeling smug and complacent in our religiosity while we're not actually fearing the Lord. In Acts 24, Felix hears Paul preaching. He's discussing um, righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, and Luke records that Felix was scared. And this isn't just a scared, afraid reflex at phenomena that's terrifying, like a mountain shaking in your presence and fire and thunder and looks like the mountain is exploding because of the divine presence at the top. This is a short-lived fear at the preaching of God's word. And it gripped him. It caught his conscience. And he was legitimately afraid, Luke says, even uses the typical word, fabel, uses the typical word for fear there. He was scared. He was afraid. And so there was fear involved at the preaching regarding righteousness, self-control, the judgment to come. He started understanding the biblical definition of what righteousness is. He started thinking about what it means to have self-control. He realized he didn't have any, I would assume. And then he's thinking about the judgment to come and thinking about standing before a living God who knows all of his thoughts, all of his intentions. I mean, he is the leader. He is the governor of Judea. He does not, he's not used to answering to authorities. He's used to having autonomy. And to think about the judgment to come is incredibly unnerving. And he is scared. He has a, a very real fear, but it's short-lived. Because he just says, enough of this guy. Put him back in prison. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. The fear of the Lord, it's not short-lived. It's not mere respect. It's not being afraid or scared. It's not short-lived. 
It's not a fight or flight response, as I've already mentioned. Fight or flight response is what you see with Adam. Adam sins, and he is scared, and so he flees, and he hides himself, tries to hide from God, ironically. It's so foolish, but nevertheless, that's the natural reflex of not the virtuous fear of God, but the sinful fear of God. I remember, I remember one time, you know, I was a junior in high school, um, I remember it was a Friday, I, I, I remember we were, I, was gonna, I was heading out to go hang out with some friends, and um, I had parents who loved the Lord, I had been taught in church, I had read massive portions of scripture, um, and at that point I was professing to be a believer. And I remember, it's, it's probably the only sincere prayer that I remember praying before I was 18 years old. And at, as a junior in high school, I remember walking out, I was, I was leaving my bedroom, I was standing in front, of my, in front of my bedroom door in Winona, Kansas, and I remember the prayer I prayed like it was yesterday. Lord, why won't you give me one weekend without consequences? I'm glad my dad can laugh. <laughs> that means a whole lot for him than it does for me. That's great. There it was. There it was. The fight or flight response. There's a, there's a fear of the Lord that causes you to flee away from God. There's a fear of the Lord that causes you to be angry at God. There I was shaking my fist at other times fleeing. I might fight, I might flight. Take your pick. But that's not the godly, virtuous fear. Finally, it's also not a fear of punishment. It's not a fear of punishment. Look at 1 John for a second, and I mentioned this passage. And I'm not mentioning that passage as a throwaway passage. It's incredibly important. It's a great passage. There's nothing wrong with the passage. This passage actually is extremely helpful for the fear of the Lord. It's just that sometimes I'm a, I fear that it becomes misapplied and it takes away from what the Bible uh, does say about the true virtuous fear of the Lord. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 is the passage about love casting out fear. So, go back to verse 15. Verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. A true believer is somebody who confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. He has to say the right thing about who Christ is, his identity. And so you can actually be disproven in your profession by your doctrine. That's the, one of the two major tests that John gives us in this epistle. Your tests of a living faith would be two, two categories. There's a bunch, but two categories. One's doctrinal, and that has a whole set of tests. And then another one is, is practical, how you live, and that has a whole bunch of tests. And so this is the mark of one, this is a necessary mark of somebody who has been born again, who God dwells in and whom he dwells in God. Verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and there is one, I'm sorry, and the one who abides in him, oh, let, me, let me start that verse over, or that sentence there. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in the world. Verse 17 is so critical to, under, to not misunderstand verse 18. Now in verse 18, when he starts to talk about the fear element, he just got through finishing the discussion about being terrified without answers at standing in the day of judgment, exposed and ashamed. Verse 17 talks about confidence in the day of judgment. So now verse 18 says, there is no fear in love. That's not saying there's no fear of the Lord. We're going to see that's actually patently synonymous with loving God. The fear of the Lord is patently synonymous with the love of God. This means there's no fear in love because then there's a sense of, there's no fear of, I'm going to stand in judgment and, and it's, it's going to go poorly. There's no fear of being ashamed. There's no fear of condemnation. There's no fear of having your guilt still hanging around your head and shoulders and then you having to pay for those, uh, for those sins and those crimes against God. There is no fear of that variety in love, but perfect love casts out fear because, here it is, Fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. It's not a fear of punishment. And just think about this, because we've got to get moving on to the positives here. If the only threat associated in our thought of God is the fear of punishment, 
then guess what happens? When there's no condemnation, now there's no more fear. Imagine, imagine trying to live the Christian life without the virtue of fear. Imagining that all that fear of God is is just a fear of punishment, a fear of consequence. Then you get to Romans 8, and it's all over. There's no condemnation. Great! I'll live how I want. No, that's not at all what the fear of the Lord is. It's not a fear of punishment. It actually is a, a, a positive fear, and it actually changes your whole life. But it actually cancels out the fear of punishment. The true fear of the Lord does not lead to fleeing God. It doesn't lead to passivity. It doesn't lead to inaction. Even the third tenet in the parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 25 is questioned. The five tenant, the two tenant, and a talent, sorry, the talent, not the tenant. I'm confusing parables there. The five talent guy, the two talent guy, they both are faithful with those resources and they are diligent. And then the Lord returns and finds them faithful. But the one talent guy, he buries it. And then the master shows up and he says, oh, here's your talent back. And remember what he says? What, what's going on here? I was afraid. That's not the virtuous fear of the Lord. That's a fear that leads to passivity. It's a fear of punishment. He was gripped by a fear of punishment. He's like, I don't want to do anything wrong. I don't want to lose this talent. And so instead of being driven by a desire to please the master, he was consumed with a fear of punishment. And it drove him to passivity. The most vigorous, the most energetic servants in the kingdom for the Lord are those who fear God the most. If you are negligent, indolent, lazy, lethargic in your service of Christ, you need to grow in the fear of the Lord. Well, we've got a few minutes left here. We've got to start. We're going to see how far we get on this and the positives. What is the fear of the Lord? What is the fear of the Lord? And what I did is I went through and I listed several passages that are going to help us understand positively what the fear of the Lord really is. And some of these are going to be extremely expected. And this first one might be surprising. This was surprising to me. Let's look at Psalm 130. Did you know that the positive definition of the fear of the Lord is that, the, that this fear is only possible because of forgiveness? This is so fascinating. This is what starts to gear our minds toward this virtuous fear of the Lord that is unlike any other fear. In Psalm 130, verse 3 and verse 4, we, kind of, we find a passage that had caused me a lot of struggle as a young Christian. I remember reading these verses and thinking, I clearly don't understand what the fear of the Lord is because these verses don't make sense in the traditional definition, the Merriam-Webster definition of fear. Well, Psalm 130, verse 3 the psalmist writes, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, oh Lord, who could stand? If God Almighty kept track of every single one of my iniquities and he marked them in a ledger, no one could stand before him. Okay, that's clear. Got it? Now, verse 4. But there's forgiveness with you so that you may be feared. Hmm. Okay. That's, that needs some thinking. I remember reading that and thinking, okay, if there were no forgiveness. Like if I wrote that psalm as a young believer, I would have said, if there's no forgiveness with you, then you will be feared. Because I was still struggling with the wrong view of fear, a fear of punishment. The punishment view of fear would only make sense if it said, because there's no forgiveness with you, you are feared. If forgiveness for sins was not even a possibility, all we would be left with is a fear of punishment. We would be living our lives just waiting for the hammer to drop. I'm guilty, there's nothing I can do about it, and I'm terrified of that day. I'm going to try to ignore that day and hope it doesn't come. I think I'm wrong, but that's what my conscience is telling me, so... Silence my conscience. And that's how we would make a living. And that's how the unbeliever makes a living. And the sophisticated silencing of the conscience just grows in its sophistication the more religious and the more truth that they understand. This verse does not say that. This verse says the opposite. But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be feared. Without forgiveness, there is no virtuous fear of the Lord. 
The fear of the Lord is predicated upon the possibility of forgiveness. It started to dawn on me when I, when I started thinking about that purpose statement, the, the for, be, the so that, the that, or in order that. It's a purpose statement. It's because there's forgiveness with you so that, or in order that, this could be the result. Fear of God is actually possible because there is such a thing as forgiveness. And I started to realize that what, what the psalmist is describing here is that the virtuous fear of the Lord is something that's only possible when there's a real relationship with God where I can have a forgiven relationship, a reconciled relationship, and that's actually possible. So I started thinking about that verse, and I started thinking, okay, what, what's that like in life? And the illustration I came up with is this. So you picture, you picture the stunt devil, the, the guy who's just going to put on a show at Niagara, and he's going to walk across, you know, on the tightrope, right? He walks across the, on the tightrope and, and, you know, and does it, you know, carrying a pole, and then he drops the pole, and then he carries a wheelbarrow or whatever. And all the, you know, you've heard the, the real stunt devils, and you've heard the sermon illustrations of that kind of phenomenon. Well, I remember picturing that kind of phenomenon when I was studying this verse, and thinking, you know what, if it, if it were up to me and my own innate, super athletic, tight roping, tight, tight rope walking skills, there's a 0% chance of me making it across. So if it were up to me to walk across Niagara on a tight rope, all, the only option is the fear of punishment option. It's just inevitable. I mean, I might make it 10 feet and fall to my death, or I might make it two feet and fall to my death. Those are the only options. However, if actually getting across is possible, think about that kind of fear. The professional who actually has that ability, where it's a real possibility, is not careless about that endeavor. It's focused. We can get across this tightrope, we can get across Niagara, don't lose your balance. Don't start leaning. Just keep your poise. Don't stare at the water. Just keep your keep totally equal. All those are whatever. I'm just making it up as if I know what that what they would do. Whatever. Imagine whatever a tightrope walker actually thinks about. They're doing that. They are focused because there's a real possibility of getting across. And the psalmist is sitting here saying, because there is forgiveness with you, in, that's the, the very cause of which we can actually fear you. A forgiven relationship with God is possible and so is fear of the Lord the fear of the Lord says I can actually please God I can actually rightly relate to him this is incredible that doesn't cause casualness that doesn't cause indifference it's because it's actually a reality according to this psalm and according to every other passage in scripture that talks about the gospel and atonement and forgiveness that kind of relationship with God is possible. What is this fear of the Lord? Well, it's possible because of forgiveness. It's possible because it's, of its forgiveness. We got one more, well, not one more period, but one more t today, and then we'll pick it up next time. The scriptures also teach us positively about the fear of the Lord by the categorical opposite Fear of man. The fear of man is one of those few fears that we can think about and understand that has a similarity to the fear of God. And that's because we don't think, when I talk about fear of man, we're not talking about being scared of people. You know, we understand what it means to be scared of people, and maybe you're an introvert because you're scared of people. And Okay, I get all that. But you think about what the Bible talks about as fear of man, it's being consumed with what man thinks of you. Consumed with pleasing man. Terrified of offending people. That's the fear of man. And that's a similar essence. That's an essential fear that's the same as fear of God. Just the opposite object. You either fear God or you fear man. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts the Lord will prosper. Right? Remember that one? The fear of man brings a snare. Because guess what? If you fear man, and I'm in this room, and I'm fearing you, that doesn't mean I'm... Scared of you? Oh, I'm not going to talk because there's people. I mean, that could be, I guess. A fear of man would be, I'm talking, and what's gripping and motivating me right now is, what do you think of me? And imagine if I had the unfortunate task of trying to please all of you in this moment right now. I mean, I don't know how many people are in this room. 
But every single individual in this room is another target, another soul, another mind to please and to be consumed by. That is a snare. I can't possibly operate when I'm gripped by the fear of man. There are too many people to please. And beyond you, what's worse is me. I'm also a man. And if I want to please myself, guess what? That's a moving target. Because my desires to please myself can shift in a nanosecond. I mean, that's a guy who's just frenetic. He's all over the place. His life is just unraveling at the ends, gripped by selfish ambition and pleasing man and thinking, what do people think of me? That's miserable. The only sober way to live life is to fear God. That's all that matters. What does God think? What does God think? So when we talk about fear of man, we're not talking about being scared of people. We're talking about similarly to fear of God, consumed with pleasing him, terrified of offending him. And similarly, we're not concerned about what man can do to us. We're concerned about what God can do to us. So now, let's look at Matthew chapter 10. We'll close with this. Matthew chapter 10. This is a very familiar passage, and you would probably have expected this in a series like this. Matthew chapter 10, let's pick it up in verse um, 24. This is the uh, second discourse in the Gospel of Matthew. He has five of them. So here we are in the second one. He's still, still uh, reaching toward the, the pinnacle of the book, which would be the rejection of the king of Israel um, before they um, um, start planning and plotting to, to kill him. In verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. And so he's instructing on the fact of the fact that if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be treated the same way he was treated. And uh, the antagonism is peaking, uh, starting in chapters 8 and 9 and culminating in chapters 13 and following. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign the members of his household? So in other words, if you're going to follow Jesus, and they called Jesus Beelzebul, if they called him Satan, if they called him a, a demonic, God, man-made God, then they're going to do the same to you. So verse 26, therefore don't fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I mean, the question here would be, why would you fear man? Because they could kill me. So? Do we believe that? I wonder. I've never had to live that out. And I've, I've asked myself that. I ask myself that when we read stories of the martyrs. Well, is my faith, is, is it, is it going to hold? Well, my exercising of faith is quite fallible, but I'm quite confident in Christ. I trust he'll give me what I need. But we have to be asking the question, why would we fear man? Because of what they could do to you. What can they do to you again? The answer is nothing that matters. What matters is what God can do. God is your God. He's your creator. He's your judge. And Christian, he's your father. You should be consumed with thinking about pleasing him, and you should be terrified of offending him. Well, we're going to take a break there, and we'll come back and finish this up. Next week, of course, is Easter, and so we're not going to have a quipping hour. We will finish up this particular study of what the fear of the Lord is in two weeks. And then from there, we're going to start um, uh, at least one, one session on, on where does it come from and how do we get it? How do we grow in it? And that'll be a sermon on the relationship of the word of God and fear. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go on from there. But two weeks from now, we'll pick this back up. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for clarity that you give us. Thank you for this study on, your fear, on fearing you. And Lord, as... As the boys and I prayed on the drive here this morning, won't you, won't you cause this study to grip your people with a greater fear of you? 
won't you answer this prayer to establish your word as to your servant as that which produces a reverence for you? Of course you'll answer that prayer, Lord, or else you're a liar. On the basis of 1 John 5, 14 and 15, we, we come to you with boldness, praying in line with your character, praying exactly what you have revealed your character to be, and that is a God who is worthy of fear and a God who must be feared and a God who has commanded us to fear you. And so now we're coming to you thankful for the clarity from your word, but also acknowledging, Lord, our fear of you is so often complacent. We cannot afford to be complacent toward a God like you. And so we beg for grace that we would grow in a fear of you. Grip our hearts, consume our minds, so that we would be restless, and that we would be um, inconsolable until we find ourselves in a position, by your grace, where you are being feared. And we probably haven't even started to scratch the surface of what that may, that may mean for us in our own lives. For some, that might mean winning the battle of fear of man among peers, for some of us, that might, that might mean winning the battle to, wanting, to want peace in our marriage, but to, to actually be tempted to not love a spouse biblically or in a Christ-like way. And for some, that just might mean giving up the comforts of this world or the lusts of the eyes or the boastful pride of life. Lord, we cannot afford to be complacent with a God so great as you. So grip us with a fear of you, that we might cling to you, that we might draw near to you, that we might uh, love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. You're dismissed.